The Jeep Wrangler 4xe Rubicon. We've already done a video on the Rubicon. In fact, we've already done a video on every single variant of the Jeep Wrangler at this point, including this 4xe drivetrain. And when we were starting this video, we were going to make it about this Jeep. However, what we've decided is we're going to have a philosophical discussion with you guys, the audience, and amongst ourselves. We're going to be talking about the future of cars and this push across every brand to move towards EV products. Like this Honda Accord we're sitting at right now. Essentially, Honda's moved all their vehicles towards EV products as well, which we're going to be talking about in our future Accord review. As a quick refresher on what the 4xe is, it is the electrified or plug-in hybrid drivetrain for the Wranglers. In fact, the second most powerful drivetrain option with its 17.3 kilowatt hour battery and its electric motor combined with a turbocharged four cylinder, you get 370 horsepower and over 400 foot pounds of torque. Returns reasonable fuel economy, you're looking at the mid 18s, and it still maintains all the functionality and compromises of a Wrangler. It's still a cabin that's built around its ability to be an off-roader, a convertible, a vehicle you can take the doors off of, and maintain appropriate approach and departure angles. All the 4xe essentially is, is a drivetrain option. It's paired to a regular trim level. So in our case, we have the Rubicon, which is the most capable off-road variant of the JL. But anyway, let's go for a drive and talk about the future of EVs and cars. Got me out of bed for this, it better be good. Mark, we're back in the Jeep Wrangler 4xe, but instead of talking about plug-in hybrids in this capacity, let's talk about hybrids and electrification overall. We've already done a video on this vehicle. I thought we did a video on the 4XE. Well, apparently <laughs> I'm an idiot and I don't know that X means buy oh, okay. in, uh, <laughs> in Jeep terms. but. All right, in this product, as a quick summary, it's a Wrangler that happens to be plug-in hybrid. It's one of the faster variants of this. No, it's not as fast as the 392, but yes, it's probably faster than the V6 and the base four-cylinder. Is it better for it? I don't really know. It does return 18 miles per gallon, which for a Wrangler is huge. And the electrification part of it, it does do the EV crawl for 25 miles great, and the rest of the time it's just a regular hybrid. And yes, if you do tow with this thing with zero battery charge, sooner or later, it will no longer create peak total output, just like you see in a McLaren or any of the other plug-in hybrids. But all right, enough about that. How do you feel about this technology as a whole? Clearly for Jeep and Stellantis, this is their stopgap till they acclaim to go pure EV, but at the risk of sounding inflammatory, where you see the next five, 10 years of cars. We've been doing this now for almost half a decade, which is crazy to think about. But. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of changes too. Uh, so when we can get on this endless loop of talking about this, but there's two ways I'm gonna look at this. The plug-in hybrid hybrid market is essentially in a case like a, 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 this Jeep product, and there's gonna be a lot of cars and trucks like this. It's purely based around compliance fuel economy standards, emission standards, it's it's the halfway to get there, you know, before, you know, the regulations say you have to get rid of internal combustion. So, and I think a lot of development in terms of mindset, that's exactly what they're going for. How do we get this done? How do we make it work? How do we meet the standards to get the fuel economy, to get the emissions met? and what existing technology do we have and what can we invent without bankrupting ourselves? And that's what this feels like to me yeah. personally. It's a rattly ass four cylinder, rattly. It sounds like a diesel. In the cold, it's it just grates on your nerves and granted this is a truck, but I mean, a lot of these designs are that way. You have the complexity of having that engine. You have the complexity of having to have a battery pack that has to be charged, the thermal management of that system, and all this associated electronics. So you're doubling down on the long-term complication to uh, for the owners, right? The long-term complication for the owners, for the manufacturers to have to meet the targets they have to meet. And some companies do this better than others, but really, essentially, you get rid of refinement, you get rid of a little bit of the range, the horsepower, and to your point earlier, once you lose 
the, the, the main battery pack gets depleted and you're on gasoline, you lose horsepower, you lose torque output. It's Particularly if you're under load for long periods of time. Yes. In a Wrangler, you're not going to be tracking this like the McLaren Arturo, but right. you will be towing with it. So if you're going uphill and you deplete the charge, according to the engineers, you will reduce total power output. But I, I but guess that's the fine print of all of them, though, yeah. right? I mean, like, this is the thing. You know, like when you went to the McLaren launch, they're like, yeah, you know, in a normal track session, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to wind up having to dial back the power after a certain amount of load. It's just part of the way the system works. You only have finite resources in terms of battery. So you get this really cool number for the marketing stuff to say that one time at max capacity. But, you're but getting, why just not make it a regular hybrid? Then? I, I, that, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, like Toyota's been doing this forever, and I'm not going to pat them on the back, but they were really perfected that technology, and it just works, and it's pretty seamless, and it's consistent most importantly and when you go to service it in like 10 15 years depending on where you live you know it's not to the, the point where it's really really horrifically complicated to repair and to get parts for these stop gap type vehicles the plug-in hybrids the plug-in hybrids you know they're going to have the mandated they're going to have parts requirements for like 10 years for supply chain but they're not going to be readily available they're not going to have a kajillion on the bank these are going to be very small window cars that are continue to evolve and evolve out of this and that's why i feel like a lot of the time from a consumer perspective these are a lot of disposable cars to meet the numbers they have to meet it's not a very good time in car history to be buying into this stuff at least to keep so my next question then is, when I, uh, this is becoming sort of a philosophical conversation. How do you think EVs are going to fit into this overall conversation, right? Clearly you and I have beat this drum now for at least the last couple of years that all of these EV products are beta products. Yeah. But now that we see the infrastructure coming in and manufacturers fully embracing electrification, do you think that we're gonna meet these, these these milestones of the government and the manufacturer set by this state by 2030 by wh whatever all these cars are really going to be ev or do you the think the short answer is no and, and i'll tell you why i think the the economy will dictate that as soon as the economy really starts to take a hit and cars are not moving they're not selling in volume they need to and the manufacturers start getting in trouble and people can't afford cars and then the manufacturers are going to be like, well, there's no way we're meeting these targets, right? Like, we can't sell enough cars. Now, why are we putting this out there? And they're going to get it delayed. I really think not just on that side, but I think there's a practical part of trying to get the resources needed to convert all every single car on the planet to meet all these, these regulations that are not particularly realistic. I think it's going to get moved out. At least it should for the sake of consumers and long-term desirability of having cars that are not just going to be in the dumpster or people can't afford to fix them we're already seeing that now people cannot afford to fix their cars the modern cars because everything's so expensive so you're you're kicking that can down the road so when people can't afford to fix their cars and they can't afford to buy new cars who are you going to point the finger at i mean it's it, all this shit rolls downhill and from the manufacturing the business side of this let's be honest these companies are forced into doing this and then they have to spin all the PR and marketing bullshit to tell you how great it is when most of the people we talk to readily admit they're not where they need to be you know it's it's hard it's hard on the business side it's hard on the manufacturer it's hard on the engineers to kind of get this stuff out there and it's not the greatest thing and I mean again it always goes back to the consumer if you play the short game you're gonna get you're gonna pay for it in the long run and you could alienate buyers if they ha you can't afford to fix it you know, if we're buying a bunch of disposable shit that we can't keep, that hurts the economy. I mean, it's just bad. I, I don't know. I think at the risk of getting circling this back to Toyota and in some ways Honda, clearly if you look at these two Japanese brands, they're prioritizing hybrids versus yeah. going pure EV. Honda does have the relationship with uh, well, soon Sony, which you and I are going to talk about in the future, but immediately GM. But at least their mainstream cars, they're pushing more towards hybrids. Yeah. Toyota, Acura Toyota, who now is stepping down and is just going to be on the board, has pushed all of their product lines to be a pure hybrid drivetrain. Do you think that is probably a more realistic, immediate five, ten year future that all cars will just be hybrids versus EVs and plug-in hybrids? I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all approach for this stuff. And by putting the the rules in place 
not every company works in the same confines. If you look at Toyota's presentation from 2015, they already had the roadmap to do this. Now they're behind in EVs, but the hybridization part was already set in motion like a decade ago. So they had this plan for a long time. Now, if you're a company, a smaller company, like Mazda or Stellantis has gone through, you know, uh, different revisions of problems and scalability, you're going from a company that was really heavily rooted in internal combustion, V8s, V6s, yeah. they didn't have a huge product plan ahead of time for this and they're being kind of forced into it. It may not be the best solution for this company, you know, and we've seen it before you know, where it's not a great model for everyone to do this. So I, I don't know, man. I'm curious to see from what a commoner perspective, because then this is just us rambling. Yeah. But it's a real conversation. What our viewers think long term of like what OEM should be doing, because clearly, you know, regardless of how you feel about the environmental impacts of cars, yeah. the government is instigating or instituting this change where we're all going to have to move into this direction. Right. Yeah. What do you think? I'm curious to think, see what OEM. Sorry. I'm curious to see what our viewers think about where they view the future of cars. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that. We, again, we could talk about this for days. There's so many different layers to this. Well, thankfully, Mark, I'm over my Jeep. Look, I know we're a pair of Debbie Downers, and if you are a traditional automotive enthusiast who loves the sound of V8s and burning dinosaurs, a all-electric future may seem improbable or depressing, depending on who you are. When you talk to the engineers at all of these OEMs, and you put them aside and you go, is this happening? Are we really going to have to say goodbye to all of our internal combustion engines? They all look at you, if they're not coming from a traditional EV brand, like, I don't know how the f the government expects me to do any of this. And that's the truth. A lot of this has a giant question mark associated with it. But in the meantime, a lot of these compliance products, a lot of these hybrids or plug-in hybrids, do offer some immediate benefits to the average consumer. They do return good fuel economy and the systems now are becoming reliable. But I don't know what the future holds. I don't know if we're all gonna drive around in Jetsons pods or we're gonna have to fight in some moon in space over spice. But I do know what products are like now and for the next couple of years at least, we're gonna be seeing a mixed environment of EVs, V8s, plug-in hybrids, and traditional hybrids. So with that, thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon.